What is a feast to a poor farmer? Is it a fancy meal you would find in the city? Is it the very best from his fields? Or is it just enough to fill the belly? This farmer and his family were at the mercy of nature. It could be a problem with the weather, with disease on the crops, or maybe pestilence, or maybe just market conditions. Very few things were in their control. Today I want a victory for this poor farmer's family. We are going to make them a feast. In 1800, two-thirds of the jobs in the United States were agricultural. These people were working on farms doing agricultural things. Compare that to today. Today, two-thirds of 1% of jobs are agricultural jobs. I grew up in farm country. There were fields on every side of our house, and we engaged in farming as a hobby farm. My father was a tool maker, a machinist, and yet he would come home and do farming on the side. So I remember planting corn by hand, running tractors, harvesting corn, working with livestock, and so many of the families around us were doing almost exactly the same thing. Men would have a factory job, and then they'd come home and do a little farming on the side. I've seen agriculture change in the last 40 years, going from small tractors, small farms and individuals to huge sort of factory farms, thousands of acres and gigantic pieces of equipment. It is a wholesale change in what's going on with farming today. The cornerstone for this family's feast is bread. It's not the classic white wheat bread, which is a high-end bread for the 18th century. This is a hearty bread made of one-third rye, one-third cornmeal, and one-third wheat. This isn't the lowest of the low, which would be just corn or just corn and rye, but with the addition of the wheat, this raises this level of bread up. This is a feast bread. This recipe is so simple, it's one third of each of these. I'm gonna do about six ounces of cornmeal, six ounces of rye, six ounces of wheat. And for the first step, we need to boil our cornmeal in a little bit of water. Farming and farm products are the foundation of the economy in the 18th century. That's where money's coming from. This is how people survive. Not only does the farmer have to understand the crops, the soil, the weather, he also has to be an engineer. He has to be the fix-it man. Whatever happens, he's got to be ready for it so that he can bring those crops in. Farming is the most common occupation in North America in our 18th century time period. The farmer is feeding not only all the colonies, they are exporting food to the rest of the world too. They're helping feed the world even in the 18th century. A farm in the 1700s looks completely different than a farm does today. Farms in that time period were very small, usually something like a one man and his family could handle and they were growing multiple kinds of crops. So they would have three or four, maybe five different crops growing in a season so they could rotate those around. And it was probably a lot more like a small market farm is today. So we can see in our mind's eye this perfect little 18th century farm, and we can idealize that and think about how wonderful and lovely it is. The truth is, is they had so many difficulties. The weather was unpredictable. They had no idea what was coming next. Is it going to flood? Are we going to have a frost? And then we have pests, insects that come in and attack a particular kind of crop, or we have disease. And that is happening all throughout our time period, making farming very, very time consuming and difficult. It's impossible to have year after year of great crops. You have to be able to do something else. You can't survive on farming alone. The richest part of our meal will be a white chicken fricassee. And chicken is the perfect thing. It shows up in the colonies all the time in the 18th century. Very, very common. And chicken is wonderful because you don't have to preserve it. If you're butchering a chicken, it's perfect for one meal. All the ingredients come from a local farm, whether we've got butter, milk, the mushrooms, the chicken, and the recipe is a very simple one right out of Hannah Glass's cookbook, The Art of Cookery. 
We start this off by skinning and deboning our chicken and then taking the pieces and stewing them over the fire in a little bit of water and milk. Once they're tender, we're gonna remove those and create the sauce with a little bit of butter and cream and mushrooms. And the recipe calls for, yes, a little bit of nutmeg. You might think that the farmer is eating the cream of the crop, all the best that comes off of his land. But the truth is he's doing just the opposite of that. Those things bring the best money. So the best animals or the best grains, those either stay for seed crops so that he has the best to put in the ground the next year or the best animals to breed from, or he's taking them to market. And he's eating the leftovers, the worst part of his crops. As I'm preparing this food, I'm thinking about the farmer 250 years ago. I'm thinking about the life the farmer and his family has and how difficult it is and what it must have been like to be around the table eating a feast just like this. I want it to be an amazing feast. To top this meal off, we have a little bit of root vegetables, some carrots, and also to make it fresh, we've got fresh peas out of the garden. On a small farm, dairy is one of the main agricultural products, but milk goes bad very, very quickly, and so you need a way to preserve that. We've got two main ways. We've got cheese and we've got butter. And today we're gonna make butter in the very simplest method possible. We don't have a butter churn. All we have here is a little crock with a lid on it. We're gonna pour cream into that and then shake it until we get butter. It's that simple. The life of the farmer 250 years ago is one of continual toil. He's working from dawn till dusk. And it doesn't matter whether it's during the spring, in the summer, or in the fall, or even when you get into the winter. He's doing something every day to keep his family alive. He's always got to worry about what the weather's going to be like. He has to worry about whether there's a problem with his crops or his livestock. There is never a time to rest. Eating a meal like this would be one of those circumstances where you could sit back and relax, maybe just for an hour or two, not think about those concerns of the day, enjoying the people you're with and the time that you have together. This is the Poor Farmer's Feast and it is very good.